when I was a little girl, I used to love fairy tales. Snow White, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, it was my favorite. I was always encouraged how they would take something so broken and it would end up so beautiful. Well, as I've gotten older, I've come to realize life is not a fairy tale at all. It's very real. But you know, God can take our brokenness and He can make something so very beautiful. So join me as we explore chapter by chapter stories of faith, determination, and courage of people that you may very well know. You may not think you do, but we all have a story to tell. I'm Jeff Hughes, and this is my story. So thinking about my home growing up, uh, it was awesome. Uh, it was full of love. My mom, my dad, my little sister. We, uh, we would get together often with grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. I would spend the night at my grandparents' house a lot and hang out with my cousins and my sister, and we would just have a blast. Um, the older I get, the more blessed I realize I was. Uh, really took it for granted then. I just thought that's the way all families were. With church attendance, uh, my family was very involved. I uh, uh, began going to a church at age six, a new church, that there was another guy there that was also six, and we just hit it off, became really good friends, and I was there pretty much all the time. Um, Sundays, Wednesdays, when they had um, things for us. I can't say that I really paid attention a whole lot um, at first, uh, sitting in the pews, playing dots and tic-tac-toe with, with my friend Tom. But in that same church um, I was still attending, around age 12, I started realizing that there was more to Christianity than just attending church. It wasn't about just going to services and, uh, and doing, you know, checking off the boxes, that kind of thing. But I fought it. I fought it for about three more years before I really made the decision to give my life to Christ. And it was, it was age 15 before I really sat down, prayed, and meant it to make Jesus Lord of my life and, and give my life to Him and to then begin a process of figuring out what that meant um, and how to grow in that relationship. And then it was about a year um, a year and a half later, I was 16, and that faith was tested. Um, as a junior in high school, I started having some just weird symptoms with my body, and had just finished uh, a season of football, so a lot of the things we kind of just shrugged off as not a big deal, uh, but more and more things started happening, symptoms started showing up. Um, and to the point where I was falling asleep at school and, and I just, I didn't sleep in school. I was studious, I wanted to make good grades and was just having a hard time feeling rested. And then eventually um, went to the doctor on a Monday. They thought it was mono. Um, mono test came back negative, the week progressed. I wasn't in school that week and they continued doing more tests. And by Friday of that week, they still didn't know what was going on with me. Uh, more symptoms had started popping up in my body and um, just little things like bloodshot eyes and then black, look like black eyes, like I've been in a fight, soreness in my chest and um, different issues that uh, were becoming not normal. And so they sent us back home that day and, and I remember like it was yesterday, being at home with my mom and the phone rang and I was in my bedroom just hanging out because I you know, was tired and didn't feel good. And the phone rang and mom was in the living room folding clothes. And I remember walking through and just telling her, you know, I'll get the phone and answered the phone. And it was uh, my nurse, my doctor's nurse. And she said, uh, Dr. Clark wants to admit you to the hospital to run some more tests. I'm 16, you know, I still wasn't thinking that much about it. So hung up the phone, said, okay, hung up the phone and, and went and told my mom. And then when I saw the look on my mom's face, 
I knew something wasn't right. And so they admitted me to the hospital that night, started running tests on me over the weekend. And by Monday night, uh, those results were coming back. And they, uh, they told me I had leukemia. You know, I'm 16. I thought I was invincible. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if, uh, I remember asking the doctors, I said, what does this mean? Do I have, you know, a week to live? Do I have months? Do I have years? Can I fight it? You know, what's, what does this mean? And then they began explaining the process of what was coming next. And they were going to send me to St. Jude in Memphis. And that's where I began a two and a half year protocol doing chemotherapy uh, through St. Jude. During that time, it, I met the darkest, one of the darkest moments of my life. I can remember the chemo and, and just the effects of the cancer um, on my body. And, and just like getting that phone call, I can remember still picture it in my mind. I can still picture it in my mind later on in that process sitting on my bed in my parents' home during all the, the chemotherapy and just wishing that I would die. The pain was so severe, it just, it riddled my whole body and, and I, just, I didn't want to live anymore. I didn't want to live through it. Uh, I still had faith in God and, and I knew that if I died, that I knew where I'd be and I'd be with, with God in heaven. I don't even know to this day how many people were praying for me, but we would get letters and cards and money and gifts just flowing in and prayers, churches, entire churches were praying for me and miracles happened. About two months after I was diagnosed, I entered into remission. And then from that point, I still continued um, through the, the chemotherapy protocol to finish out the two and a half years of what they set up for uh, leukemia through St. Jude. And like I said, uh, two months into it, I was in remission. Uh, things were going well. Uh, as far as me progressing through their protocol, I did have an option to put uh, a port in my chest or a thing called a pick line also in my chest. The port is um, subcutaneous. It's below the skin. I like to swim. I like to get in the water. So I chose that. A few months after that, they were, you know, it's where they stick you to put your chemo in and everything was going great until one day they realized the chemo wasn't going through. And so they started doing some testing on me. Um, turns out it had clotted off. I had blood clots on that um, port, which was direct line into my heart. And so the surgeons were extremely uh, concerned. They would not do surgery on me. Um, the concern was that if they did surgery and tried to pull the port out, the blood clot would either go directly into my heart or go straight to my brain. Either would be a death sentence. And so they put me on a blood thinner protocol um, in addition to the chemo and everything else I was doing. So we started that. Um, I had to be extremely cautious. I couldn't cut my own food. I couldn't be around anything sharp. I was on a high dose blood thinner. Um, couldn't play sports, couldn't do anything that I wanted to do um, athletically. And so it kind of sidelined me for a while. As God continued working through that, they kept doing uh, x-rays and testing on it to see where it was uh, with the clot size. It had gone down enough that they wanted to go in and do surgery. So they went back in and pulled it out. But when they did, the there was still a little bit of a clot in there. It did break off but instead of going to my heart or my brain, it went to my lungs. Best place it could have gone, saved my life. Um, and I had the, the pulmonary emboli in my lungs for a while, working through that. But through all of that, I mean, God just continued to show out and he, uh, he just continued to work miracles. I mean, I, I wouldn't be here if God hadn't worked miracles through that. So as I was finishing up chemo, uh, I don't remember exactly the time frame. I know it was right around uh, freshman year of college, as I was ending high school, I began working with our church in a in a leadership role. We had this was a small um, old school Baptist church, and we had a Sunday school director. 
And he approached me one day and said, hey, I'd really like you to come on board with me and eventually take over this position. So I began doing that, and it's kind of my first opportunity to, to be in the ministry um, in that capacity. Um, I can't imagine what, what that looked like now, um, you know, probably stumbling over myself and, and trying to teach the congregation because I was, you know, 18, 19 years old. I didn't think, you know, I had a lot to say, uh, but fortunately God's Word has a lot to say. And so just learning um, how to study God's Word at that point and be able to teach it to others, I learned a lot. As I was going to Murray State, I finished up my chemo my freshman year um, during our finals week and then um, began getting involved in missions through the Baptist Collegiate Ministry at Murray State. And through that process, um, they started talking about missions and different places that they were going and doing, and so I signed up for a mission trip. And all this while, I'm still, I'm still, you know, doing the leadership role to church, and ended up spending a whole summer down um, in Arlington, Texas, at a mission there, and absolutely loved it, and and really left that summer feeling like I thought God was calling me back down there. So I come back to school in the fall at Murray State, begin the praying process of, you know, do I stay at Murray State? Do I transfer to UT Arlington um, so I can and still work at that mission? And just trying to process that with God. And at the same time, a pastor came to me and said, we want to create an organized youth ministry in, in our church. And it's going to be a paid position. Um, and we've met, the deacons and I have met, and you're our first candidate. Are you interested in that? I was taken back. Honestly, I never saw that coming and was a little scared of, of the possibility. I didn't really understand, you know, what all that meant. But I did tell him in that conversation, I said, well, you need to know this is what I'm praying through personally about leaving Murray and going down there to work at the mission. Through that process over the next couple of months, he and I would meet and pray and talk to my campus minister about it as well. And we prayed through it. And eventually I, I felt unrest about going. I actually went on a, a campus tour down at UT Arlington. And in the midst of the campus tour with the tour guide, I left. I just walked off because the answer was just so evident. God was saying, this is not where I want you. And so I left there, went up to the mission, just found a quiet place to pray and, and process it all and just to make sure that that's what God was saying. Uh, I came back to Murray, told my pastor, said, you know, this is where I need to be. This is, this is where God's calling me to be. And so at that point, we began the process of hiring me on uh, as a youth and children's minister. My college years, you know, they weren't wild. Uh, I was really involved and poured myself into those two ministries, um, surrounding myself with positive people. Didn't really know, uh, you know, what all that meant then, like I see it now, um, being the age I am, but, but I know that it was beneficial and, and it saved me from a lot of stuff. Uh, my major issue was, was when I was younger. Um, innocently, my, my next door neighbor and I, my buddies, we would go riding uh, around the county uh, around our house growing up and one day we were out riding and found a, a dry creek bed and we we're just out riding you know enjoying being boys and and we went up to the top of one of the creek beds one time and just happened to find a, a stack of papers didn't really know what they were until we picked them up and started looking at them and realized that it was pornography and you know I'm, I'm age 13 around that at this point never seen anything like that before um, but Satan has his ways of infiltrating and and trying to snag people and he did snag me he snagged me for a while it wasn't really until uh, I was diagnosed with leukemia when I was stuck to a hospital bed that that God rescued me from that and just I didn't have access to it so I was just supernaturally broken of it and very, very thankful for that. Really believe that that saved me. God saved me from a lot 
a lot of headaches and heartache that I would take into uh, my later years of life if I had made some different decisions. So I'm thankful that God guided me and that I was open to, to hearing his guidance during that time of my life. As I was wrapping up college, um, began really talking about marriage and ended up right after college getting married. And through that was given two beautiful daughters from college, went to Owensboro, and I was uh, at that point doing full-time ministry with uh, a church, working with the youth and children there. And then from there, I really felt like God was calling me to do more uh, with my schooling, and I really fought it at first, because um, in my mind, I was thinking, why would I want to go to a school to learn about ministry when I can just do ministry. And so I fought God for a while on, on pursuing any more schooling. Uh, finally realized through you know, some different things that, that he was he's pushing me and wanted me to do that. Um, so through that process, I moved down to Texas and uh, worked on my master's there. And during that period of time uh, is when I was blessed with uh, my first daughter finished up schooling there and was a young dad, a uh, young husband, and we ended up moving back closer. We moved to Evansville. I was offered a job doing campus ministry on the, the campuses of, of Evansville, Indiana. And through that time period, I was blessed with my second daughter. And uh, I, there's just no greater joy than becoming a dad and getting to pour into uh, kids. Never did I ever dream that I would, would live through a divorce. Um, I love the family life. Uh, I love being a husband. I love being a dad. And I just didn't see it. I didn't see it as part of my life, but it became a reality in my life. And that's really when I hit my second darkest moment that I've experienced in my life. And I can remember still, I can picture it just like the other times. I can picture where I was. I can picture everything around me. And I can still remember the thoughts I had and thoughts that maybe they would be better off without me. And the spirit of depression had, had set in and was attacking me. And so de demons were coming after me, Satan was coming after me, trying to thwart God's plan for my life and what God wanted to do through me. And I really began listening to it and thinking, you know what, you know, maybe I don't have anything to offer. And then the spirit of suicide came after me um, and really began thinking, you know, maybe this is just what I need to do and be done. Thankfully, God broke through and, and just destroyed those demons and began a process uh, of healing. Um, it wasn't easy, you know, it, it just wasn't. Um, going through all of that, it wasn't easy on me. It wasn't easy on me spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. I struggled quite a bit and, and people that knew me uh, knew that it wasn't really me um, that, was, that was here, it was like a shell of me um, I didn't have anything to give to people uh, out of the overflow. I was just an empty guy. And fortunately, I had some, some men around me that, that poured into me and uh, began just counseling me and helping me through it. And, and the one turning pivotal moment that I remember was a mentor. We were sitting eating. He'd take me out to eat. And we were sitting at a meal one time, and he just said, Jeff, you have a broken marriage. You don't have a broken life. And for whatever reason, that just resonated. And it was just like God just poured those words down into me. And from that point, just healing just started just escalating. And, and the healing process went so quick after that. And just processing through all of that, uh, and getting back to where I could give to people again and minister to people again because that's, that's who God's anointed me to be is a minister. 
as I process through all of that, um, I begin attacking back and letting God pour into me. Um, and one of the people that I began meeting with was a great buddy of mine. Um, he was my, my big brother in our fraternity at Murray State. Um, met him down there. Um, guy a lot of y'all are going to know, Johnny Newcomb. Um, he and I would would uh, meet together. I'd drive up here to Marion, and and uh, we would hang out. He would pour into me, and uh, he always jokes about uh, how you know I'm not always a talkative guy, but a lot of times when we would meet, he would just listen, and I would talk and talk and talk. It's amazing that you know in 1996 when I met Johnny, did I ever believe that. You know, all those years later, God would bring us back together in a way that Johnny would be used to pour into me and, and to encourage me and to build me back up. And not only that, but to introduce me to a really cool lady. And about two years after my divorce, one of the sessions, you know, talking to Johnny and and just some of the things that I was saying to him about trying to date uh, as an older guy, a Christian guy, trying to do things right, trying to date, it just wasn't easy. It, it just wasn't on a lot of levels. And some of the things I was saying to him, he just looked at me funny one day and he goes, you sound just like somebody I know here in Marion. And I was like, oh, really? And he was like, yeah. And he goes, I think you two need to meet. Through her side of the story, I uh, I didn't reply quick enough, but I know there were some people in the church here that were encouraging Stacy to to message me, and she didn't want to do that. She didn't want to be that proactive in messaging a guy, uh, but they kept encouraging her. So she sent me a message on Facebook Messenger, which I rarely check, and she'll know. I don't remember, but days passed. Uh, before I responded to her and uh, evidently that's detrimental to a, a female <laughs> but I, uh, I it wasn't intentional I just didn't check it much so when I did message her back we started talking she explained who she was and and we realized Johnny was the connection and uh, began just a, a conversation over social media just talking through Facebook Messenger and um, texting and and it was that was at the end of May of 2015 and we really didn't go on our first date until July of 2015 where we actually met face to face just because of work schedules and not living in the same uh, town and um, vacation she had planned with her boys and vacation I had planned with my girls and uh, just going places we just couldn't make it happen and then we finally did uh, go on a first date in July of 2015 and it was great uh, I mean absolutely great and uh, realized by the end of that night I wanted to go on a second date and so I asked her out again um, we ended up going out a second time and a lot of that date was just talking telling our life stories, um, sharing our hearts with each other. And honestly, that night, I knew, I knew God had brought me an amazing woman. And I remember texting Johnny or calling Johnny and, and telling him, man, you introduced me to my wife. And uh, he was floored, you know, he didn't know he was a matchmaker, but uh, it's just amazing how God just brings all things together. You know, when you think things are falling apart, and God began orchestrating all of that, you know, just meeting Stacy. He began orchestrating it back when I was in college. I mean, I, I can't do the math that quick in my head, but 1996 to 2015, that's 19 years. It was when I, 19 years from the time I met Johnny to the time he introduced me to Stacy, and God knew it all along. So as Stacy and I were dating, uh, Dating as, as Christians, dating as uh, adults, um, has its pros and cons. It's tough, but uh, through that process of dating and getting to know each other, 
there were a few things that we really wanted to be uh, strategic about and part of that was was sex and holding that off until we got married um, part of that was uh, introducing each other to our kids she had two boys from a previous marriage I had two girls from a previous marriage you know being smart and wise about when to introduce the girls to her and the boys to me and so we prayed about that uh, talked through that uh, we both agreed that we wanted to wait just to be sure that this is God orchestrating our lives joining together so we uh, probably a month month and a half um, after I felt like you know that second date that God had delivered uh, her to me to be my wife we brought our kids together and we did a, a uh, just a fun day together. But also through that time, Stacy was already a part of Life in Christ. She was a member of Life in Christ. Um, I was still a member of a different church and uh, was actually on, on staff part-time at another church. And we would still get together and date when we could and hang out. But she would also interject these questions, whether we were in person or over the phone or text or however. She would just interject these questions. And one time she was just drilling me with these questions uh, about me and, and what I want to, what I saw between us. And, you know, and I just stopped her and I said, I feel like you're interviewing me. Is somebody giving you these questions to ask me? And, and she said, yeah, my pastors are. And, and so, they, uh, you know, were pouring into her, and I wasn't offended by that. I was actually excited about it. I was like, this is awesome that she's got these type of people surrounding her that care enough about her to make sure that she is who she needs to be, and she's looking for a guy who's, who's right for her. Um, and then through that process, when we uh, realized, you know, this is, this is getting serious, um, she was on the praise team um, and is on the praise team and at that time they did uh, praise and worship practice and one praise and worship practice I showed up and I had already talked to Pastor Chris and Pastor Sue about wanting to come in and propose to her during practice because I knew she cared so much about the praise and worship team uh, she loved it and that was her family and she just loved being able to worship in that way and lead people in worship and I thought there's no greater place to propose to her and so uh, you know my perspective I knew what was going on because I'd already worked it out with Pastor Chris and Pastor Sue and and they knew what I was doing and we had it all orchestrated well Stacy didn't know obviously and so I stand up after this song that uh, they practiced a song that was dear to me um, it was a remake it as well and just had always spoke to my heart in the years when I used to stand and sing hymnals uh, from hymnals and uh, this it is well song was just practice and I was I said well that's when I want to break and propose to her and so I stand up at the end of that song and she's on stage and I start talking and start making my way to her and she's, uh, from her perspective, she's freaking out because she's like, you don't interrupt practice. What is he doing? So she, she was really nervous for me. She thought I was going to get in trouble. But uh, that's, that's how I proposed to her. That's how I knew where I wanted our relationship to go. I wanted it grounded on God. We both wanted God as our foundation. And we knew we needed God as our foundation to have a long and lasting, uh, fruitful, amazing marriage. We needed him. And through all that process as well, after engagement, uh, we had Robert and Karen Brandon were our accountability partners, and they would check on us and encourage us and make sure we're staying pure and faithful and, and um, doing what we need to do to stay as uh, Christian adults dating and through engagement. Um, and then we went through premarital counseling with Pastor Chris and Pastor Sue, which was amazing. Uh, it was so much fun, uh, laughing, tears, everything that you can imagine, but very, very beneficial and much needed. The physical attraction was there. I'm, I'm not going to 
you know, dance around that. Um, I, you know, part of the, the amazing thing about marriage is God created marriage, created sex for marriage. And so we knew that uh, that's where our life was heading, was to be married to one another, to join our lives together, to join and blend our families together. And so we got married November 8th of 2015. Uh, and so a lot of people think that sounds fast. It wasn't fast enough. <laughs> so it is, you know, marriage is tough. I'm not gonna lie. Marriage is tough. It's, it's work, even for Christian people, it's work. Every single day, uh, marriage is work, love is work. It's, it's learning and growing and working through life's ups and downs and depending on God. So if I can encourage you guys, have God as your foundation. Whatever status your relationship is right now, seek to put God as your foundation. That's the only way your relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend or fiance or husband or wife is gonna grow and be fruitful and be what God designed it to be. So as Stacy and I were approaching our wedding day, we were also trying to figure out where we're going to go to church. She was a member here at Life in Christ. I was a member of another church and was actually on staff part time. And uh, what we did was we visited each church. So she came to mine first and visited. Um, and so obviously it was a little difficult for me to get away, but I asked for a Sunday off. And it actually was the Sunday before our wedding day. And that was my first Sunday ever walking into life in Christ Church and I knew instantly that this is where we were going to be uh, it was it was absolutely amazing just the the power of the spirit and just how alive the church was through worship and through um, teaching of the word and and just every aspect of it I knew um, when we left that service I told her I said this is this is where we're supposed to be and so at that point began the process of resigning from my position and, and the transition uh, of getting married, obviously it was transition, but transition of um, coming together as a family and then uh, beginning to worship together. Uh, it was amazing. And through that process, learned about the power of the Holy Spirit. I knew of the Holy Spirit, you know, as you know, as a minister and, and studying the Word um, since I was young, I knew of the Holy Spirit, um, and I knew it was powerful, obviously, but I didn't really know personally. It's kind of like with Job, how how he knew of God, uh, but he didn't really know God until the end of his trials and everything he went through. He he says that at the end of Job about just how much he. He knew of God, but didn't really understand. And that was kind of what it was for me coming here, was just learning the power of the Holy Spirit. One night, Pastor Chris was doing uh, just a prayer service over people that wanted to receive their prayer language. And I had told him you know, days before, I don't remember at this point in time frame, but I had already talked to him and said, you know, I don't, I don't really understand what that means fully uh, but I want it and, and I believe that it will open up a whole new uh, realm of power spiritually from God for me and I can remember in that service he just point blank called my name and told me to come down and uh, I needed that and I'm glad he did that uh, he doesn't normally do that so don't get nervous <laughs> but he knew me and we had talked beforehand and knew that that's something I wanted that I was praying about and seeking and so he just pushed me pushed me to come and, and receive it so came forward he just he prayed over me uh, and then Pastor Sue came and just started talking to me about it and helped me in that process uh, it was it was slow because um, I'm gonna tell you this right here, my brain got in the way and I was overthinking it a lot. I'm a processor by nature. And so for me to break free from just the cerebral part of it and just allow the spirit to flow through me uh, was my biggest hurdle. Uh, but that night, as Pastor Sue was talking to me, 
encouraging me. I just, you know, one word, or just really just part of a word, just came out. And, and as they were praying over me, I could just feel, feel fire running through my body. It just started at my feet and went all the way up my body to my head in a power that I'd never, ever experienced in my life. And I knew then that I had just received something amazing, something that was not of this world, something that only God could deliver. And I was really excited about it. Uh, a little frustrated at first because I didn't have a lot because uh, I'd heard some other people praying in, in their spirit and I didn't have all that at first. And so I just began practicing it, you know, just, just saying what I had. And, and the more I prayed in the spirit, the more came. And now it's an active part of my prayer life. And through that, uh, and through uh, some studies that um, Johnny and I have done together, and, and through uh, Pastor Chris, Pastor Sue, and other pastors that have, have preached here and, and just poured into us the power of the Holy Spirit, it's revolutionized me and in my walk with God. This past year, I know a lot of people struggle through 2020. Um, and it was hard on a lot of people. I'm not downplaying that at all. But for me, it turned a new chapter in my life spiritually because I realized through some of the studies and the teachings that I've said under here, Life in Christ, and through the, the books that Johnny and I have been reading together, the authority that I have because I have the Holy Spirit living in me. Now I stand, I stand firm in my faith. I stand firm against all the principalities of darkness. I do not fear them. I stand in defiance of them and I fight them. I stand armored up with God's armor. And so if I could say anything about what I've learned so far in my time at Life in Christ, it is the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. And as believers, we have that in us. Nothing, nothing can stand against us. There is no power in this world that can stand against the spirit that lives in us. And that's the power and the authority that I live under now. I'm Jeff Hughes, and that's my story.